Hello, hello, hello. This episode is sponsored by Spoken, a new startup company run by a group of English teachers who've worked out a way of delivering English courses directly into your pocket through your smartphone. With Spoken, you can get business English lessons through WhatsApp, WeChat and other messaging services. What happens is an English teacher from Spoken will send you tasks in the form of texts and videos and you respond with your keyboard or the microphone on your phone. Then the teacher sends you feedback and other tasks which are adapted to your needs. Each lesson is short and you can respond whenever you want. And it can really help you to improve your practical English for your professional life in a really cool and convenient way. And the guys at Spoken are offering you two free lessons and then 20% off all of their courses. To find out more and to get that discount, go to getspoken.com slash LEP or click a Spoken logo on my website. You're listening to Luke's English Podcast. For more information, visit teacherluke.co.uk. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the podcast. How are you doing today? I hope everything is well out there in Podland, wherever you are, and whatever you're doing, as usual. Uh, here's a new episode. And um, so last week, I did a teacher talk at the British Council in Paris. Uh, teacher talks are when the British Council invites guests to an event involving a talk on a specific topic, and then there are drinks afterwards. All the teachers are invited to talk at these events, and uh, this time I thought that I'd have a go. The topic was completely up to me, so I chose to talk about British humour because it's always something that I'm thinking about, and I thought it might also be a way to promote English language comedy in Paris. The talk I'm glad to say, was sold out, and it went well. Uh, everyone seemed to enjoy it and find it interesting. I did some comedy as well afterwards, and that went down okay. So I was hoping to upload the recording of the talk here on the podcast, but unfortunately, it's not good enough. The sound quality isn't good enough. Um, I didn't really mic myself up properly. I just left a microphone on the table next to where I was standing, but it wasn't really close enough, and as a result, it sounds very echoey and muffled, and it's not really good enough for me to publish on the podcast. Next time, I will mic myself up properly. So I'm not going to play the recording to you in this episode, which is a big pity, because there were some moments of interaction with the audience and some funny things that happened. But it's just not clear enough on the recording, so I'm not going to publish it. The room at the British Council where we do these talks is a big high ceilinged place with mirrors on the back wall and high windows and walls, so the sound bounces around a lot. Anyway... I've still got all of the ideas in my head, so I'm going to put them into this episode, recorded in the normal way. So I went to Amber's place just a couple of days ago, and I decided uh, that I would discuss all the points in my talk with her, since I think she's probably got some interesting things to say on the subject as well. We both have experiences of living in other countries, and we both do stand-up, uh, so we think about humour quite a lot. Uh, so... Um, you're going to hear us attempting to answer questions uh, like this. Uh, what is British humour? What is it like? Is it funny? Does it even exist? How does it relate to our communication style? And what does it say about us as a culture? The main aim of this talk and this episode is just to describe and demystify humour in Britain. You'll see that I don't subscribe to the idea that British humour is somehow better than other forms of humour. In fact, in many ways, it's very similar to humour in plenty of other places, but there are some differences. As I describe it here, just think about whether this kind of behaviour is likely to be found in the culture or cultures that you know, and also consider the role that humour plays in people's daily lives where you are from. You might notice differences or similarities between the humour in your country and British humour. OK, so now let's go to Amber's place and get to the bottom of this subject of British humour. Hello, Amber. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. Good. Good. Here we are, sitting in your flat again. Yes. Last time we were here, we were talking about uh, restaurant experiences and TripAdvisor reviews. Exactly. Remember that? I do remember Pop it. Popular episode. Well, we had a lot to say. We did, didn't we? We, we grappled with interesting problems. We did indeed. And maybe we can grapple with a few more interesting problems 
this time round. Because I thought that uh, in this one, uh, what we could do is go through the uh, topic that I talked about at the British Council the other day. Did you hear about this? I did a talk. I heard you did a talk about comedy. Um, Well, more about humour, really. Mm -hmm. And there is a difference between humour and comedy, because... You know, whenever you're talking about that subject, the two things always get mixed up together. Mm-hmm. So we'll we'll come back to that. But it was about British humour, and at the British Council they have teacher talks, which is where a teacher talks about a different subject. And in the past they have they've had people doing stuff about like David Bowie and photography and French music and opera and all this stuff. Mm-hmm. And the marketing guy from the British Council was always trying to get me to do a talk and. and like a few weeks ago, he said, hey, Luke, how about you do a talk for us in, in like April or something? And so I was like, oh, yeah, all right. I think I'll do one about British humour. I might be able to have, I might be able to say a few things about that. So I thought I'll do a talk about British humour. And then as I was preparing it, I realised it's a really complicated subject. It is. I mean, yeah, it's complicated. It sounds complicated. Yeah, it is complicated, but... I've done all of the work and the research and the writing and the thinking, and now I think that I've I've worked one or two things out. You've about, cracked it. About, I think I might have cracked the subject. <laughs> you cracked it. Nice I've, one. I've cracked, and I've also cracked the subject <laughs> in the in the process. Okay. So what I thought we could do is now actually I recorded the um, I recorded myself doing the talk. Mm-hmm. I put my little microphone thing on the table. Zoom. The zoom. One of the zoom family yeah like the baby zoom baby zoom was on the table but baby zoom didn't pick up the voice properly what i'll tell you what it sounded like it picked like. up all the surround did it, it? Pi- it picked up loads of the echo from the walls couldn't you were you speaking to a microphone i didn't have a mic i wasn't mic'd up ah. i should have been mic'd up do you know what would probably been better your iphone yeah, I know, just on the table. Yeah, because th- that's with the zoom, it gets all around. Yeah, it does. It's very good at picking up all of the different noise in the area, in the area, in mm, the, area, in in the, the place. Area. I'll, I'll give you an example, listeners, of what it sounds like. I mean, I'm going to recreate it. I could just play you the recording, but it's very much like this. So I'm going to point the microphone away from myself and then talk. So this, pod, this uh, presentation is going to be about uh, British comedy. Uh, or British humour, in fact, because the two things are different. It's kind of a bit like that all the way through, and yet mm. not not even as clear as that. But generally, the talk went really well, and the place was full. It was completely fully booked, so it gathered quite a lot of interest. Clearly, nobody understands what British humour is, and mm. they all decided, let's come and find out the, the answer to this mystery. Does everyone at the British Council, are they British? I mean, I know that, that might sound ridiculous, but are they all British? You mean the staff that work there? Yeah, could you be an American person and tra- and work at the British Council? We let Americans in into the building okay. from time to time. <laughs> um, no, there are people from all over the place. Most of the people working there are British, but I think um, for the English lessons, they do draft in people from uh, places like America, Australia even, uh, Ooh, Ireland. The colonies. Ireland, that's right. That's technically, is it? That's United Kingdom. Let's not Ireland. go there. Ireland is not the United Kingdom. The Northern Kingdom. Ireland. Yeah, Northern Ireland, but Northern I'm not talking Ireland. about Northern Ireland. I'm right. talking about right. the Republic of Ireland. Which okay, well, it's a different country different altogether. Countries. Okay. So yeah. at the in the audience, I had mostly French people who'd come either because they were students at the British Council learning English or they were friends or family of students uh, there. Mm-hmm. I also had a number of uh, teaching staff in the room from the UK and, and from other English-speaking countries. And um, I also had the marketing manager... And I had the the general director of the of British Council mm. France uh, also sitting in, uh, watching the talk, which was no pressure, no pressure at all. <laughs> uh, but I'm glad to say that it, it went very well. And I basically started the thing by telling them who I was, that I've been teaching English to adults for over 16 years, and that learning a language and teaching it can be difficult. So a sense of humour is vital. Mm. Uh, <coughs> also, I'm a comedian and I do comedy in Paris, which means that I do stand up in front of groups of French people and tired expats and I try to make them laugh. And again, a sense of humour is quite important in that one. Um, so British comedy or British humour, sorry, not British comedy. Um, mm-hmm. So British comedy or British humour, sorry, not British comedy. Um, mm-hmm. The reason I chose to do that is because humour is important to British culture. It's really important to me personally. 
And generally, I think that exploring our sense of humour is a good way to get to the heart of British culture. Mm. I say get to the heart of it. I'm not sure of the heart, maybe one of the other organs. So it could be a good way to get to the kidneys of British culture or... Possibly. You know, that's the aim of this talk, essentially, is to get to the lungs of British culture. That was a joke. Yeah. I did that on stage. (laughs) I said that and they they didn't really laugh. And I said, that was a joke. And then they all laughed. And I said, there may be some humorous elements to this. But then do you think, well, this is just back to the Russian joke. (coughs) Oh, here we go again. Um, No, but I mean, you know, like you said a joke. It didn't work. You said it's a joke. And everyone laughs. <laughs> right. Because that's what British people would do. Like, that's why the Russian joke was so remarkable. Because you told the joke, they didn't get it. You told them it was a joke. And whereas the English people would have laughed, no one, no one laughed. <laughs> but in Which, this, let's not go down that wormhole. In this case, I'd said this stuff. And then I was like, that was all very funny. Um, <laughs> and they all laughed. And then I said, there might be some humorous bits in this talk. So be prepared. I'm not going to tell you which bits are supposed to be funny. It's like a sort of a, it's like a sort of mystery adventure talk where, you know, can you guess which bits are supposed to be funny or not? Yeah. You know, and then I said, you know, this is all supposed to be self-deprecating humor, which is not meant to confuse you. In fact, what you're supposed to be doing is going, oh, he's got self-deprecating. How charming. Yeah. I really like him. I'm warming to him. I'm going to enjoy this talk. That's what that kind of stuff, you know, that's the purpose of that kind of, chat at the beginning self-deprecating yep. humor to make everyone warm to you at the beginning of, of the talk uh not to confuse everyone so there's a quote and i don't know who originally said it the quote goes and i've said this on the podcast before the quote is uh, explaining a joke is like dissecting a frog have you heard this no explaining a joke is like dissecting a frog you understand it better but the frog dies in the process <laughs> yeah no i have heard it yeah right so basically doing humor And talking about humour are different things. And Mm. I say that because I thought that some of the people in the room might have come because they expected me to be doing hilarious stand-up comedy. Because you have done stand-up at the British Council, which I heard was really good. Yeah, I have done some stand-up at the Christmas party and it went well. Um, So the poster also said that I was a stand-up comedian. So they were probably... I thought that half the reason the audience were there was probably because they thought it was going to be a kind of a comedy show. Mm. So I had to say at the beginning, this is... Not going to be, a, most of this is going to be boring, factual stuff, you know, dissecting jokes, which won't be funny. I'll be talking about humor. I won't be actually doing it. So please lower your expectations now. <laughs> and I put that on the slide, you know, lower your expectations now in big letters on the screen. Did they all laugh? They all laughed at yes, that. Yes, of course they did. So the contents of the talk is basically in three stages. Uh, the first bit is uh, an informative bit about British humour. That's most of the talk. The second part is a more in, is more informative stuff about comedy in English. Mm. And then at the British Council, the third part was a funny bit where I do some comedy. And at the end of the presentation last Thursday, mm. um, I did about 15 minutes of stand-up, um, which is probably what they came for. Well, it's nice to do a little bit. Yeah. Because it's just a nice way to end, isn't yeah, it? It's a bit yeah, yeah. sad to have a whole talk about British humour and comedy and then be like, goodbye. Well, that's it. There are biscuits. <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> have a biscuit. <laughs> so I did do 15 minutes of stand-up at the end. And it was it was good, actually. And I kind of went off stage, announced myself back on and got them to scream <laughs> and shout. And I came back on and then I did a 15-minute set and it went really well. Good move. And it was nice. You, you can tell when it when a set goes well because people are coming up to you afterwards going, yeah. oh, that was really funny. I really like that. If you're not funny, no one wants to talk to you. No. You know. But uh, and you can normally tell straight away because n- no one laughs. Yeah. Well, That's there's always that. a great indication. But there's there's sort of four levels of comedy gig in my experience. There's... The worst, which is where people are outwardly hostile to you and might be shouting things or whatever. The second is when they're just silent. The the third is where they sort of give you a bit of laughter because it's polite Mm. and they feel it would be rude not to. And the fourth one is where it's really genuine laughter Mm. and you've, you know, they're really enjoying it and they come up to you after the show and they tell you how great it was. Yeah. Um, And, um, you know, some people came up to me after the show to say they enjoyed the talk and they, they thought it was very funny. Uh, not all of them, but some of them did. So I, th- I count it as being a good show. I think it went all right. So the first half about humour. Mm. 
And um, so it's probably worth noticing that difference between humour and comedy. My, my explanation was that humour is the way that we socialise with people. It's the sort of funny stuff that happens in social situations. Okay. The way that we make each other laugh with our friends and stuff. And comedy is entertainment that you get on TV or on stage. Yeah. That's the difference. And mm. uh, I made that distinction because whenever I talk about humour, people always start to give me examples from the world of comedy. Exactly. They'll immediately say Monty Python. Yeah. For French people, Monty Python or any, or yeah, examples, concrete examples of yeah. comedy shows. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think they're different. I think that the way in which uh, a country likes to entertain itself with, uh, you know, funny stuff on stage is a little bit different to the way that people interact with each other in their normal lives, yeah. uh, in their daily lives, you know, at work and stuff. And that humour comes into both of those things in slightly different ways. Okay. You know, so there's a there's a difference between the TV or entertainment culture and the actual communication culture, and so humour for me is all about the way that we use uh, laughter in our daily lives. Okay. So that's the starting point. That's the main part. Um, and so, um, basically, what is British humour is the question. And my first point is that it doesn't exist. So actually, British humour doesn't exist. It's a bold statement. It's a bold statement. It's b why? But, well, the argument is that um, uh, essentially, looking at British humour, I've realised that we don't have like a unique type of humour that no one else uses. No, but, but then, I mean, but then, because why it's such a difficult thing and such bold statements, because... It's like famous. They're famous for something. You're, you're calling them the emperor's clothing. You're saying British humour is just the emperor's clothes. Well, it's kind of a, a rhetorical question or a rhetorical statement or something. I mean, it, obviously there is such a thing as British humour because otherwise I'd have nothing to talk about. Mm. Uh, but the, by saying that there's no such thing, what I mean is that there we don't have any distinct forms of humour that other people don't have. Yeah. The, the things that we use when we're being humorous, are exactly the same ingredients that everyone else is using. That sounds fair. But the difference is that we value it a lot more than many other cultures. We just put a lot of more value on humor in our everyday life mm. than many other cultures do. And it's pervasive. Mm. It's just all the time, anywhere, anytime, any place. We're always prepared for it. We're always sort of prepared for the for that potentially humorous statement and the multiple meanings that you know people give when they when they make their statements and things like that there's no specific time and place for humor it just can happen anytime and anywhere in britain and we put a lot of importance onto it then as well as that there are certain features of humor uh, which everyone shares but mm. which we tend to use a lot more more yeah. So other cultures, essentially, what? So I mean, that does sound fair because that's, I mean, why other people find British humour, whether it exists or not, funny is they're seeing British comedy mm -hmm. and they like it. They understand it. They find it funny and it's, they've got this reputation. But you're just saying British people enjoy it more. They're more prepared for it. They put more value on it. In our, in our daily interactions. Yes. Like if you work with an English guy. He's going to be making jokes. Yeah, you'll notice that he's making comments and sometimes you think, is he joking here or is he not joking? Mm. And it's hard to tell uh, where, where, whether he's joking or not. And you find that British people will throw sort of sarcastic or understated humorous comments into situations where in many other cultures it wouldn't really be the, the done thing. Is that your experience too? Being Because you've travelled and worked abroad yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Uh, but it's it's hard to tell, but I think so. Mm. I can give you an example. Um so, you know, I've taught English for years and I've met many many people from different countries and I've taught multinational groups and things. Mm. And um I mean, I I remember one student I had for example who was from Germany. The thing was that he he could never tell whether my comments were designed to be humorous or not now i don't know if that's just because my comments weren't that funny and it wasn't that obvious <laughs> or whether he just wasn't able to identify it and yeah. it's a, maybe a mix of the two and you know i used to have fun by i wrote on the board this this is a joke and every now and then when i said something funny and he didn't react to it i would point to that sign and then he'd laugh <laughs> well i i have a drama class that i teach and i couldn't go to it because uh, the the crash was on strike so i texted my colleague who's English, and I said, oh, could you put up a sign to let the kids know? And he wrote on two pieces of paper, uh, Amber's not here, so no, he said, 
no Amber equals no drama club. And underneath he wrote, so fuck off. And the kids, the kids are only, they're little, they're in primary school and sent me a photo just to make me laugh because obviously he wasn't, he was going to take off the second piece of paper that said, so fuck off. He just did that. Just to make you laugh. To make me laugh. And then I showed it to Nico and he was like, oh, did he write that? I was like, no, of course he didn't. It's a joke. It, of course you wouldn't he's he's a teacher of right. young children he's not going to tell them to fuck yeah. off so you are, you immediately identified it as a joke whereas Nico didn't thought notice it. he was being rude he took it on face value he did which you know I've I've encountered many 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 times in my experience of people taking my comments on face value yeah when they're not supposed to be taken on face value or obviously joking sorry one more thing about Germans I knew a German guy and he was you know it was the opposite he kept saying things and I didn't know if he was joking I spent my whole time laughing a lot but I don't think he was actually ever making any jokes you read it he was just really dry he just sounded really dry Mm -hmm. and hilarious but I think he was just not joking just talking just talking so this German guy I had who's a lovely guy and as I said he he couldn't really deal with I mean it, it this makes me sound like a real no, but it's hard when you're teacher. doing when it's, you're in a different language as well. It makes me sound like an idiot teacher who's like trying to make the students laugh and failing all the time, and the students <laughs> don't know if I'm laughing. That's what it sounds like. It's not it. It's not what it sounds like. But he did sort of say to me one day, he's like, "Okay, Luke, I have an idea. Maybe I have a small suggestion. Maybe we can do at the beginning of the class. Maybe for fifteen minutes, we have like funny time." And then you stop. And then afterwards we stop and we do the serious <laughs> lesson. I was like, no, that's not going to work. <laughs> I can't imagine how that could work. I like the way you tried to problem solve it, though. Yeah. Okay, I'm having trouble understanding when Luke is S- making jokes. You need to make it really obvious when you're joking and when you're not. I need to know. There needs to be funny time <laughs> and, not- then n- and then normal time. He sounds a bit like Arnold Schwarzenegger. No, that's Arnold Schwarzenegger would be like, I don't know. <laughs> no. First of all, he'd go, wow, ah! at the beginning, right? <laughs> True. He'd be like... Your jokes are not funny. <laughs> ah, what are you talking about? And that's a terrible no. Arnold Schwarzenegger impression. No, I liked it. Going, so, ah, that's basically how you, ah, ah, ah. Where did you're he? Not, that's, <laughs> that's what he does, isn't it? Yeah, it's true. It's true. That was excellent. Sorry, I've distracted us. Keep going. This is fascinating. So the point is that we uh, we value it a lot. It's very important to us, and it's just any time, any place, all the time. Yeah. There is a note to be made here about British humour or English humour or Scottish humour, Welsh or Irish humour, mm. and that essentially I'm lumping it all into British humour. Yeah. So I might be just talking about English humour, and that you might there might be a case for. Scottish humour being different or Welsh humour or Northern Irish humour being well, different. Even English humour I was watching, and this is your fault, um, Ramsay's Kitchen Nightmares, mm-hmm. which I've become addicted to and I've been watching a lot recently. And he yeah. just did one in Liverpool. Oh, I, yeah, Liverpool. <laughs> I like Gordon Ramsay. Yeah. But somewhere like Liverpool within Britain is already famous for its sense of humour. Right. At being at odds with the rest of Britain. Mm. Well, I spoke to a Scottish friend and a Welsh friend mm. uh, who I work with. We went to the pub and I asked them about it. And I said, what do you... <laughs> so you t- went to the pub. There was a, so there's an Englishman. An Irishman. <laughs> an Englishman, a Welshman <laughs> and a Scot. Scotsman went to the pub. <laughs> to that, talk about humour. To talk about humour. It already <laughs> sounds like the beginning of a joke. So I said to them, look, um, I'm doing this talk about British humour. Do you think there is a difference between English humour, British humour, Welsh, Scottish mm. humour? First of all, the Welsh guy was too busy drinking beer to answer my question. <laughs> the Scottish guy told me, I said to him, what's Scottish humour? And basically his definition of Scottish humour was exactly the same definition that I was giving for British humour, mm. which is that it's self-deprecating, it's ironic and sarcastic, yeah. and we make fun of ourselves. And I was like, oh, so it's British humour then, basically. Mm. So it's funny that he, he identified Scottish humour as being different to English humour, by defining it as the very thing that I had thought was that you'd British humour. Mm. So essentially, it's this, for him, uh, I noticed it was the same thing, same humour, uh, but he attributed it to Scottish humour rather than British humour. Fair enough. I mean, I think those traits are perhaps really important throughout Britain. And these are all just... Because there's nuances, yeah. of course, in Scotland. Mm-hmm. And, and then within Scotland, it's going to be different from Glasgow to, you know... 
yeah. s- the small small places. I don't know Scotland very well. Um, but yes, but I suppose what you were saying in the beginning about the value, the place, the, the space it occupies, the importance of humour is rel- is relatively similar. Yes. Yes. And 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 also, you know, the things the things that the Scottish guy told me were Scottish were yeah. exactly the same things that I'd identified as being uniquely British. British, yeah. So dry, sarcastic, self-deprecating and so on. Yeah. So I'm just going to lump them all in together. I think it's kind yeah. of the same thing. But anyway, listeners, if you if you know, if you want to get the Scottish side of the story, then you need to find a Scottish person and ask them. And they'll tell you as long as you can understand what they're saying. That's what I was gonna- <laughs> they will, they will be able to tell you the sorry, their you know their point of view on it. Second controversial statement is British humour isn't funny. Ooh. And what I mean by that is that although we use humour on a daily basis, it doesn't always make us laugh all the time. And that's not necessarily the place of British humour. It's not there to make each other laugh out loud all through the day. Mm. Okay. In fact, laughter is not always the typical response to British people's use of humour. Mm-hmm. We're not constantly falling on the floor laughing. Instead, humour is part of our interaction, and it has the function. It has a few different functions. One, it just has the function of making you look like a normal person. Mm. So it's almost like just keeping things on the n- normal level. Yeah. You use humour to just maintain the normal level and make you look like a normal person. We use humour to make you seem all right, like a basically all right person. Because if you can take a joke and identify when jokes are happening and you can join in the joking, you're basically all right, aren't you? Yeah. You know? What do you think of Bill? Yeah, he's all right. He's a good laugh. He yeah. can take a joke. Um, mm. you know? Because telling a joke is also telling a story. Yeah, but also, I mean, in the in the sort of sort of piss taking that goes on in mm. a work environment. Yeah, you know, if you're sort of mucking around, piss, taking the piss a little bit, and the humour there is kind of uh, it doesn't always involve a lot of laughing, but you do it anyway. You enter into that kind of dialogue as a way of showing that you are you don't think you're better than everyone else, yeah. that you're basically a normal human being, and that if you've got a sense of humour, you're basically all right in, you in Britain. You don't take yourself too seriously. You that's a really important thing in Britain, that you don't take yourself too seriously. And so rather than it creating laughter everywhere, it's just about maintaining a sort of normal level of social interaction. It's true. I mean, I think those are some of the things that, are the worst criticisms you could say someone takes themselves too seriously they're too earnest or they show off i think these are yeah. big things that are really bad yeah. in the same way that it's important to enjoy humor it's important not to show off take yourself too seriously mm-hmm. or be too earnest we're going to come back to all those points ah, in okay we, i'm getting ahead when we deal with self-deprecating humor okay. but um so those functions of humor making you look like a normal person making you seem all right reducing uh uh reducing social tension mm-hmm. by kind of keeping things a bit light saying things without being too direct yes uh bonding with people and just breaking through the bullshit so mm. humor is like you know even those sort of sarcastic remarks and all that sort of thing it's just designed to break through and humor it can just cut through it all yeah and it, again it's not necessarily creating big laughs but just kind of cutting through bullshit and just maintaining normal human sort of level Mm. of uh, interaction yeah um it's designed to destroy seriousness destroy pomposity and destroy arrogance not necessarily make everyone laugh out loud all the time definitely and i think that's why it can be difficult when people do interact with british people who for everyone because they know that they've said something a bit it sounds pompous, but actually it was self-deprecating or or sarcastic. And then mm-hmm. other people, maybe foreign people, don't understand it and then think they're a dick. And you kind of, and it's very difficult to be like, no, no, I, I, I didn't mean that I, I think I'm great. I meant that oh, I think I'm great. Yeah. Like, like the opposite. Like going up Ugh. in front of the presentation going, so um, I've worked on this for a long time. I think it's going to, it's safe to say this is going to be a really excellent <laughs> presentation. Exactly. Um, don't all thank me at once. You know, that kind of <laughs> yeah. banter. And then that actually means the opposite of like, I'm actually quite feeling quite modest about this presentation. So I don't judge it too harshly. Exactly. It's all those sort of asides, you know, the don't thank me all at once or you're welcome or, you know, yeah. the, you know, oh God, 
um, maybe this is just going to be a total nightmare and we're all going to embarrass ourselves. And you said something like, oh, fingers crossed. Yeah. You're sort of saying like, let's hope not. Yeah. But it's the opposite. So it's hard to get that across. James Simpson gave me a really good example uh, the other day. We were talking about this and he said that, uh, that him and his wife were in Britain and his wife like tripped. They were leaving a restaurant and his wife kind of tripped. She didn't fall, but she tripped. Yeah. And lost her step and kept going. And the waitress was walking past and just she just went to uh, James's wife, send me a postcard next time. <laughs> Ooh. And apparently, you know, James's wife had no idea what that meant. She was like, what was, what was that? What did she just say? <laughs> yeah. And send me a postcard next time is basically another way of saying, did you enjoy your trip? Yeah. Which is a joke that you say when someone nearly trips over. They yeah. trip because trip's got two meanings. One is when you catch your foot on the floor and you nearly fall. Another one is when you go away somewhere on holiday or something. Enjoy your trip. That's what you say when someone has nearly fallen over. So when someone, in this case, she, uh, James's wife nearly fell over and the waitress said, send me a postcard next time. Mm. And so, you know, if you're... Which is a really common thing to yeah, say. Like a little funny quip and it broke the ice of the awkwardness, the tension of her nearly falling over. Exactly. It's sort of like saying, are you okay? Or like, oh, you know, don't worry. Or just, it's no prob- no big deal. You nearly fell over, but you know. It, we it, can laugh about it. We can it's laugh fine. About it. It's yeah. all fine. I'm not judging you and it's you're in a friendly place. Yeah. So actually it had the best of intentions. Definitely. Send me a postcard next time. Had the best intentions. Um, and James's wife was like, what did she say? And, yeah. you know, she took it the wrong way because she didn't realise that it w- it had this intention, like I said before, of like breaking the ice and breaking through sort of the serious bullshit and breaking the social tension and just keeping things light. Yep. And, you know, it's hard, notoriously, probably, this is probably why I did this talk in the first place. It's, it's, it's notoriously difficult for non-Brits or certainly non-native speakers, to be able to identify when the laughter is, when the jokes are happening and, and when it's not. Mm. Especially when they see other British people interacting and there's mm. not a lot of laughter going on. Yeah, it's rare that there is laughter because it's, you don't laugh out. It's not too laugh out loud. You're not trying to make the other person laugh. It's almost like a sort of intellectual stimulus. You're kind of keeping the conversation interesting. Yeah focused yeah yeah exactly and it's all done with a straight face and it's Mm. quite understated and and stuff like that so it must be very difficult to identify when people are joking or not now i don't mean to say that people don't laugh when you know they are making you know when they're being humorous in the uk of course we do all the time but there's also plenty of times when uh there's there isn't laughter involved so um the importance of british humor now i've heard lots of criticisms of my country over the years loads i've heard them all yeah Amber. yeah me too um you know like the food's no good it's just fish and chips the weather's <sighs> the crap weather. it rains all the time your royal family's undemocratic and a bit weird looking you dress badly you do everything the wrong way round. like you drive on the left you want to have your cake and eat it with europe your football team can't score penalties <laughs> and most of those things are kind of partly true yeah you know maybe the food you know it's not really true because you can get decent food in in the uk of course it doesn't rain all the time just a lot of the time yeah um our football team can't score penalties that's totally no. true but the one comment that i personally can't stand so i can i don't mind all of that stuff about the bad food the bad weather i don't care. i'm fine with that yeah i'm fine i don't care at all but the one thing that i really don't like the maybe the only thing that offends me is when someone goes, huh, what is this, British humour? Mm. Have you ever had that? Yes, yes, I have. I have that quite a lot. Like, what is this, British humour? Yeah. Um, in that pejorative tone, which means sort of like, this is confusing and not funny. Yeah. Um, for some people, British humour is just another way of referring to humour, which is impossible to understand and not funny. For example, someone tells a joke, it could be me, <laughs> <laughs> and someone else goes, oh, this is British humour, isn't it? Mm. Now, this is actually the, the, one of the most offensive things you can say to a British person. Mm. What is this, British humour? It's a bit like a British person going to France and visiting a wine cellar and drinking some nice French wine and going, what is this, French wine? Mm. No, you don't think so? Yeah, no, I see what you mean, but it's sort of like, 
Yeah. No, I mean, yes, exactly. The, the, the reason that I, f- I say that is because essentially, let's say a French person saying, what is this British humour? is like someone who is commenting on something that they don't know anything about. Mm-hmm. And it tells you more about the person than it does about the humour. Well, it's like going, it's exactly, it's like going to the carve and tasting a really, really nice wine and but, someone te- and then just being like, oh, well, I can't tell the difference. All French wine tastes the same to me. Just wine, isn't it? Yeah. Being, because the French are really proud of their wine. Exactly. With reason, it's exactly. delicious and nuanced. That's the point. The, yes, the Brits are exactly. extremely proud of their humour. And it's are. rich and it's nuanced as well. And so the person who says, what is this British humour? It's just a stupid thing to say because it reveals that you're completely ignorant to the level of pride that we have in our humour. Mm. And, you know, to be honest, the level of richness and complexity because there is a, not just in the humour, but in the comedy, you know, it's very well, yeah. important to us, basically. True. I found some data and I found an opinion, an opinion poll produced by a company called Opinium. Mm-hmm. From 2016, the question was, what makes you proud to be British? The first thing was the NHS. The second thing was British history. The third thing was the British sense of humour, uh, which came above the monarchy. So well, apparently, yes. you know, more, I hope so. Yeah, more people were proud of our sense of humour than our monarchy, than our architecture. Mm. Um, so we are immensely proud of our sense of humour. And the thing is that Brits love to believe that we are excellent at humour. We love the idea that we're great at humour. Well, I think it's also because it's such something you cannot touch or quantify. Intangible. Intangible, that's the word I'm looking for. You know, we want to be proud of something. And it's true, it's tough to be proud of, you know, even though we're proud of the NHS, it's crumbling into dust Mm. before our very eyes. Yeah, exactly. That's all we've got. Yeah, yeah, that's right. There's not much of it left. We don't have weather, we don't have... I think we've got good music. Oh yeah, the music is great. Yeah, I'm very proud of that as well. Pretty proud of that. Yeah, but um, so but yeah, whether we are better at it than other people or not, the the interesting thing is that British people like to believe that we are excellent at humour. Yes, and it, I'm not saying that we are or that we're not. Yes, but just the fact that we like to believe that just shows how much value we put into it. Mm. And this is what people are underestimating when they say, oh, what is this British humour? Mm. You know, because that's just, you know, that just shows that they don't understand the level of importance that it has in, in British culture. Yeah. And that's why it's a kind of a stupid, slightly rude, slightly ignorant thing to well, say. Well, that's what they're aiming to say. I mean, that's the whole point. When someone says, mm, what's this British humour? They're saying, like, this is shit. This yeah. is rubbish. Like, I don't understand Yeah, but it. they're saying that this and is... They're, and they're implying, of course, that, you know, it's rubbish and that, that, you know, it's not good. Well, they're implying that all of British humour is rubbish. Yes. So my my point is that if I tell a joke and it's not very good and the person goes, oh, this is British humour, my point is why are you bringing the whole country into it? Mm. What's it got to do with the whole country? It's just me. Just I just told a rubbish joke. There's no need to bring the whole nation into the situation, is there? Yeah. No. But then this comes back to this notion of like, what is British humour? It doesn't really exist, although it shares these common traits. But one thing which comes up again and again is the sort of straight facedness, mm-hmm. the very dryness, the we're not actually make, no, we're going to, we're all telling jokes, but no one's had, a, no one's laughed. There's not been a single laugh. No one's laughing. We weren't trying to make each other laugh. Yeah. Even though we're entertaining each other. And in some cultures, it's normal to slap your knee when you tell a joke and laugh at your own joke. That's not a thing. It's, of course it is. <laughs> That's not a thing. Of course it is. I mean, not necessarily literally slapping your knee, but do it. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Many cultures do something which shows that it's a joke. Absolutely. A lot of cultures will sort of do some little thing. It could involve laughing at their own joke or something like, slapping your knee to indicate this is funny time Mm. and this is where a joke has just happened you see that in stand-up though even in britain what well not knee slapping but the sort of rhythm of like pause you know this sort of space for jokes even if it's not necessarily like of course a punchline people laugh that's the sort of the where people are meant to laugh because mm. something funny, the conclusion has come along and the punchline should make people laugh. But then you sometimes sort of also see it where you're like, 
this is just the space where laughter should come. It's not necessarily a massive punchline. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. That's but that's in comedy. That's, that's yeah, that's which is how, different. I'm that's saying, how comedy but... writers uh, write comedy that right, they yeah. do the setup and then there's a pause and a punchline and another pause and you use the empty spaces to indicate to the audience where the laughter should be. But no, the thing I'm talking about mm. is the way that you know what. We were talking about how British people don't always indicate that a, hu- a, a humorous thing has happened. Yes. Whereas in some cultures, they do indicate it. And they do it by laughing at the end of the joke that they've just told to mm-hmm. show everyone that, that they're in on the joke too. And that this is where you're looking at me with this <laughs> cynical, you're looking at me with this skeptical face. I just can't believe people would laugh at their own jokes. I of mean, of course like- they do. They fucking <laughs> they do it in France all the time. Whenever a French person tells a joke, they laugh at it like it's the funniest joke in the world. <laughs> Hi, maybe. Absolutely. I mean, I think of like an, of like your uncle. You know, like granddad might yeah. laugh at his own joke. Not maybe your granddad, but a sort of I don't because it's like a cliche of someone who's a terrible joke teller laughing at their own jokes. That what that's what you say to deride someone. Oof, he laughs at his own jokes. Yeah, because in our in in Britain, that's a sin. It that's is a crime to laugh at your own joke. It is. But I, you know, why is it then, Amber, that I've met so many. <laughs> people from so many different places who laugh at their own jokes i don't know i don't know I, i've never this, you're blowing my mind open luke i like, never I've, asked i've been asked thinking this. about this subject for a long long time i can see that i mean i think it's really interesting because you're pulling apart something which is integral to british identity and i think we're all sort of aware of in a very nebulous intangible way but we've not really sort of pinned it down and it's incredibly hard to pin down because you told me you were going to do this talk and I remember mm. thinking blimey how are you going to deal with this because it's a tough subject to handle another thing is that obviously there are individuals and you can't generalize yes, of you course. know that's the other thing is that you know all the time while doing this talk I was thinking oh god I'm going to get into sticky waters here mm. if that's even an ex- expression i'm going to get into sticky territory yeah. when i start saying all british people do this and all french people do this yes it's obviously course. not going to be true so what i've attempted to do is walk that line between making broad generalizations and trying to find general trends which te- tend to be true or more true in some areas than others yeah and like there is a general trend across the uk to behave in a certain way. I mean, that's why British people are considered to be different, you know. And when you meet someone, you can kind of tell where they come from mm-hmm. based on the accent that they have and sometimes the way that they behave, you know. Yep. So there are definitely tangible differences between the way in which dif- uh, the way in which people in different cultures behave. And yep. humor is just one facet of of that broad range of different behaviors essentially Mm. you know just trying to observe the way that people behave and just noting the differences um and so yes i was saying that british people like to believe that they've got a good sense of humor because we think it's important i don't know if we really do or not Mm. um and it's especially true for humor which is and these are the words that are bandied around when people talk about british humor and the reading that i did about it and stuff it's ironic it's sarcastic it's deadpan understated and self-deprecating there are other things as well that i mean i don't know if we're going to get time to deal with all these subjects but let's keep moving so um pervasiveness i talked about that before basically here's a quote from from watching the english by kate fox Mm -hmm. and uh this uh, a businessman said this that she spoke to an american businessman he said the problem with the english is um you never know when they're joking you just never know whether they're being serious or not and apparently the um uh the female colleague from holland that he was traveling with considered that for a moment and then concluded well i think they're mostly joking yes so that going that's going back to that point of, of uh, how people often can't tell whether we're joking or not um and the point is again yeah but i mean they're joking but it doesn't mean they're also not serious mm-hmm. do you see what that I mean that comes back to what you're saying like although we're using humor we are joking all the time but still we're on our way to telling just to dealing with everyday things in a serious way yeah. I mean, but yeah because it's kind of about making a statement mm. that's, that exists on a several different levels at the same time exactly and so it's possible to make a, a statement which is worded in a way that's supposed to be sort of humorous but also at the same time is making another point it's very hard to find examples it is I was just trying to think about that myself well, there are some examples coming up okay good um, so um, 
Kate Fox said in her book, the English may not always be joking, but we're always in a state of readiness for humour. We don't always say the opposite of what we mean, but we are always alert to the possibility of irony. Mm. So when we ask someone a straightforward question, like how are the children, we're equally prepared for either a straightforward (laughs) response, they're fine, thanks, or an ironic response, which is, oh yeah, they're delightful, they're charming, they're helpful, they're tidy. Well, you'd expect something sort of ridiculous. Kate Fox, that book, Watching the English, is excellent. Is it available on Audible? Um, I imagine so. Do do you are you still sponsored by Audible? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I mean, people could, if they wanted to, listen to that book and learn about the English. They could download it free from Audible if you just go to audibletrial dot com slash teacher Luke. You can download any audio book of your choice if you just start up a 30-day trial with Audible, which is completely free. You can get a, an audio book of your choice and then cancel the, uh, the trial. You keep the audio book. Or you continue with the, with the trial and continue using Audible because it's pretty good. It is good. I use it all the time. And that book, Watching the English, is excellent. It is. If you're interested in understanding, she's an anthropologist. That's right. Mm, yeah. It's fantastic. Um, so we're always tuned in to multiple meanings, ironic understatements, modest self-deprecation, innuendo, subtle put-downs. It's just part of our culture and our communication style. Of course, other people from other countries are also tuned in to multiple meanings. But... We are especially, and that might be related to our communication style, which Mm -hmm. I'm going to come on to in a moment. First of all, deadpan delivery. I talked about that before. Deadpan, that's delivering things with a straight face. And, you know, this is where I talked about slapping the knee. That in some countries it's so you, you don't believe me, but it just feels so extreme. Yeah. It's not that extreme to slap your knee, or it, I mean that's just a an, a, an example of some little sim- signal to show people that a joke has happened, oh, or giving you know? a big wink. Well, yeah, or just sort of laughing afterwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, because you know the fact is that. Uh, some people, when they make a joke, they show the people they're talking to that, hey, this is a joke. And some people will just st- say it like any other statement. Yeah. And, right? I mean, yeah. that's the basic point I'm making there. Whether they slap their knee or they just laugh themselves or they do something else, not every culture in the world delivers a joke like any other statement. Yes. And this is why, time and time again, people have told me that they don't know when British people are being serious <laughs> yeah. or not because we don't go, hey, look, a joke is happening. <laughs> we just say the thing. Yep. Yeah, Yeah. you're right. Okay. So anyway, that's that's deadpan delivery. Communication style. Now, right, so I think it's true to say that we tend to be diplomatic or indirect or non-confrontational in our communication, especially when it, give, when it comes to giving negative feedback. Mm. Would you say that's true? Yeah. Um, we tend to avoid direct disagreements or bluntly negative comments. We find that to be uncomfortable and a bit rude. Yes. That, again, that's not to say that British people are incapable of giving a straight no answer. But we do go round the houses a little bit. Well, this is the no, this is the fame. This example is your wife. Right. Asking your parents to go to like a... Go to the castle. <laughs> historical castle. Yeah, I did this. That's exactly the thing. The anecdote that I then told in the talk, I said, for example, my wife is French. I've checked. She's definitely French. (laughs) And um, we go back to my parents in England sometimes. And my parents live next to a castle. They live near a castle. Mm. And my wife loves the castle. She wants to go to the castle. She's always going, let's go to the castle. (laughs) She really wants to go to the castle. And my parents don't care about the castle they live near the castle. They don't care. They don't want to go to the castle. Yep. They've been to the castle. Yeah. They've had enough of the castle. They definitely don't want to go to the castle. What they want to do is stay in and talk to us and drink tea with us. Yeah. So my wife emails my parents and goes, hey, maybe we could go to the castle this weekend. I'd love to go to the castle. My dad replies by going, we could go to the castle, but... Yeah. And my wife's like, yeah, we're going to go to the castle. <laughs> And I'm like, did you read the same email as me? We're yeah. definitely not going to the castle. Yes. Because he's and she's like, yes, but he wrote we could go to the castle. He means no. He means no. We're not going to go to the castle. We could go to the castle if the house burnt down. Right. And we had nowhere else to we go. We could go to the castle, but we'd quite mm. like to stay in and drink tea with you. 
means yeah. we there's no way we intend on going to the castle. We're definitely going to just sit and kidnap you and talk to you for all af- the whole afternoon. So that's the kind of con- con- communication style. And I think as a result, we often make quite indirect statements with the understanding that the other person will read between the lines and know what we really mean. Mm. So we exist within a culture where the communication is a little bit ambiguous mm. and where one person can say one thing and the other, you know that the other person is able to calculate all the potential different meanings of that and work out what's basically going on mm. without the explicit thing being said, especially if it's negative. Like, for example, if I invite you to my party and I say, hey, I'm having a party on the other side of London and you say, oh yeah, I'll try and make it. Definitely not going to be there. Yeah. yeah. I'll try and make it means I'm not going to come. not coming. I'm not coming. Right. Yeah. And, you know, they don't just say, no, I'm not coming for this reason. Yeah. They say, yeah, that sounds great. I'd love to. I'll try, try and make, make it. it. I'll try and make it. Well, it's like quite nice. This causes confusion with Americans. Uh-huh. Like if you say, oh, do you like my dress? It's quite nice. It's quite nice. It means it's really not nice. It's awful. Don't wear it. But in America, apparently, I found this out, quite does mean. Absolutely. Yeah. Completely. So, you know, like mm, quite nice. Not nice. We're giving the impression here that British people never say what they mean, which is not true. It's just that the, the communication is a little bit more ambiguous or it operates on slightly different no, rules. No, but they are saying what they mean. Yeah. Like, I'll try and make it does mean no. You just right. didn't say no. Yeah, yeah. To a British person, I'll try and make it or quite nice, your dress. We know exactly what they mean. There's nothing ambiguous about it. It right. is completely unambiguous. Right. To another British person. Yeah. If someone, if I said, do you like these shoes? And my friend said, they're quite nice. I definitely wouldn't get them. Right. Yeah. That's, yeah I understand that. I mean, obviously to a good friend, I'd say, do you like these shoes? And she'd say they're horrible. Right. Because we're good friends. But if you, you know, just a, a, an acquaintance. Yeah. That's um, how it goes. Um, I have spoken to people before about like British communication style. And some people who come from more direct cultures yeah. don't understand the indirect thing and they actually find it to be rude and they find yeah. it insincere and they also find it to be hypocritical. Yeah, I've, I've heard, heard that. that a number of times. Like, oh, that's your hypocrites because you don't say what you mean. You're mm. like lying or you're two-faced. That's, yeah. that's how it can be taken badly. That we do that sort of slightly ambiguous indirect diplomatic type of communication because we're trying to be nice and we want things to be nice we don't want to have the awkwardness the embarrassment of a of an argument or negative stuff going on we just want it to be nice and it's all sort of keeping things nice on the surface mm. whereas if you're from a direct culture they're like why are they lying yes you of know. course of course um but anyway this is the atmosphere or the these are the conditions in which a statement we're quite prepared for one statement to mean several things at the same time. Mm. And that's how, like a sort of understated aside or a cocky, like, sarcastic comment can, everyone knows what it means and we don't just take everything on face value, mm. you know? Um, okay, so there's, there's always potential for something to mean more than one thing. Self-deprecation. I heard someone say, and these are not my words, but I heard someone say that the difference between French and British humour is that in Britain you laugh at yourself and in France you laugh at other people. Mm. What do you think about that? Do you think there's any truth to that? Uh, well, well, it's, it's what you said before. I mean, all those types of humour are used by all cultures. So I've seen self-deprecating humour in France. <clears throat> but, I mean, you know, definitely, and, and the kind of comedy that I might like I would use that. But mm. it's true on a day-to-day basis when you're like in the pub or in a bar having a chat. It's rare to hear that people using it regularly about themselves. Yeah. They're less likely to put themselves down. I was trying to f- find <coughs> examples of self-deprecating humour and I found it very, very difficult to come up with the, ones. I, I, yeah. did, I sent you one, I thought, you asked me about which, self-deprecating humour. Which one did you humor. send me again? I sent you one and it was Hugh Grant because that's, yeah. he's the sort of like icon of British nurse isn't he? Yes. He's a sort of fantasy. I, 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 oh, terribly, terribly sorry. You know, all that very awkward, uh, polite and in a, inability to express your emotions. I can't say anything directly. I, you know, I just wanted to, to, to say, I'm, actually, no, forget it. I'm rubbish and I'm just going home and kill myself. Yes. That kind of thing. Charming and sort of good looking and awkward in public school. Yeah. Um, well, it was in Notting Hill and... Um, the movie. He, yeah, the movie. 
and um, which takes place in Notting Hill. And he sort of runs a little bookshop. And Julia Roberts comes in and he doesn't recognise her, but she's sort of a celebrity. And she is looking at one of the books and she picks up a book, which is, we presume, his book. And Hugh, she, Grant's, Hugh Grant's book. Yeah. He, and that he wrote. He wrote it and it's been signed by the author, him. Yeah. She sort of says, oh, it's been signed by the author. And he said, oh, yes, if you can find one which has not been signed, it's worth a lot more. Right. And, and we know that he wrote it. She doesn't know that he wrote it. Yes, exactly. And, and so this is... Uh, Hugh Grant, this is the writers telling us that he's a really great guy because he's got a modest, self-deprecating sense of humour. He's adorable because he's got like this low opinion of himself. Because exactly, he's written a book and he's obviously been successful enough to get a book published. But rather than be like, look at my book, I wrote a book. Look at it, here it is. He's sort of saying, oh gosh, don't look at that book, it's awful. Oh, it's absolutely absolutely awful. Oh, and if you can find one which has not been signed by the author, it's, you know, worth more. Oh, signed by the author, I see. Um, yeah, couldn't stop him. If, uh, if you can find an unsigned one, it's worth an absolute fortune. It, don't look at that book, it's awful. Oh, it's absolutely, aw- oh, absolutely it's, awful. Oh, and if you can find one which has not been signed by the author, it's, you know, worth more. And this is considered to be charming. Yes, and yeah. I mean, it is charming because he is... Because he... he it's not that he is not proud of what he's done, mm-hmm. but it's, you know, it is more charming to be humble. Yeah. Without being the humble brag. Because right. he doesn't tell her, oh, it's my book. Right, right. The humble brag is the example I came up with, which is when someone invites, let's say you get invited to someone's house for dinner, and the person goes, so uh, thanks for coming around for dinner. I hope I don't poison you all. <laughs> mm. And you're supposed to go, oh, no, you're a brilliant cook. Yeah, exactly. Or all those sort of like, oh, God, yes, I mean, well, oh, publishing your own book is a nightmare. All those incredibly long hours you have to spend writing, you know, you're sort of... Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're yeah. showing that There's you There's a spent- fine line between self-deprecation and yeah. humble brag, although they're worlds apart. Humble brag. Yeah. That's where you're bragging or showing off at how humble you are. Look at me, I'm so modest. Yeah, it's a sort of new... Is it a new portmanteau? Is it like, you know, it's sort of become... The internet's been a really yeah. th- thrust this forward. You know, people sort of posting up pictures and being like, oh, look at me, but without sort of trying to say, look at me, but they're really saying, look at me. Right, right. So that's like someone going, oh my God, it's so difficult being a, an award-winning podcaster. You've no idea. <laughs> it's yeah. so hard, like trying to decide what episodes to make and I'm always wondering whether they're going to be good yes and uh, and and then um, you know you're supposed to go oh no but your podcast is so brilliant darling yes exactly and no it's excellent exactly and mums do it a lot you know because that's sort of like oh gosh taking Jocasta to violin practice every day has been exhausting but I'm so proud of her for getting like grade right. 8 which is basically her way of going look she's a brilliant uh, uh, I'm virtuoso. a brilliant mummy I'm such look a great mum child yeah. yeah so that's humble brag which is slightly different to genuine self-deprecating humour which is more like Hugh Grant the author uh, putting his book down uh, without Julia Roberts knowing even that he wrote it exactly and, it, and it's a genuine uh, example of how wonderful he is and how charming he is exactly um, there are some crimes in the UK we were talking about this earlier crimes in the UK include mm. being too earnest Big crime. Earnestness is basically when you're overly sincere or too serious about yes. things. So being too earnest or being too serious is a crime. Taking yourself too seriously is also a crime. Mm-hmm. And being pretentious. Mm. Uh, and not being self-conscious or being unaware of yourself is one of the biggest ones. Yeah. That's anyone who walks through their life uh, unaware of themselves without being self-conscious, we think that there's something wrong with that yes and like the the worst like characters in sitcoms and things like the the these disastrous characters on tv they the main problem is that they've got no idea what they're really like like yes. alan partridge uh is hilarious but the reason it all works yeah. is because he's not aware he's not in on the joke yes exactly so alan we, partridge is perfect yeah we just cannot understand how someone can be so unaware of themselves Mm. and we find that unbelievable and hilarious and if you're unaware of yourself then 
you know, people really don't like it. So you've in the UK, you've got to be very like painfully self-conscious to the point where you're socially awkward. Well, it brings about both senses of the word yes. self-conscious because at the same time, aware of yourself, like the comic ridiculous figure that you're that you are in the world, and also it, it makes you, it can make you a little bit self-conscious. Yeah, it goes um, both ways. On one yeah. hand, it can be charming, and it can be sort of uh, quite quite in clever and modest. Uh, and on the other hand, it can be um, really uncomfortable and awkward and the person ends up becoming socially crippled by the level of social uh, self-awareness that they have. They become really self-conscious. So it's kind of like goes both ways. Mm. Um, and so uh, the other crimes are you know, putting yourself above others or, or seeming arrogant. Yeah. And in order to avoid these crimes and to show everyone that we're just a normal person, we make fun of ourselves and we kind of put ourselves down to show that we don't think we're better than each uh, than each other. We, if you can take a joke, you're all right. If yeah. you can laugh at yourself, you're all right too. And if you can laugh at your, uh, if you can take a joke, you're all right. What I the the witty sentence that I came up with mm. is that uh, in Britain we like to we we can laugh at how awful we are, and that's why we're better than everyone else. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, And in some cultures, let's say, for example, in France, which is quite a direct communication culture, if you put yourself down too much, you put, it's like you're in a bit of an idiot or something. Yes, exactly. You're like, well, you can you go the other way. You like... loser. Why are you doing that to yourself? That's our job. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. And <laughs> if you're too self-deprecating, like, for example, it, you know, it's like the sort of, oh, after you kind of culture. I mm. do that in the boulangerie sometimes. People are queuing up and there's like a little confusion over the queue. And obviously I'm the one who's next, but I go, oh, after you. And they go, oh, thanks. And they just, yeah. they don't go, oh, no, 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 after you. No, no, course. no, after you, after you. Um, and similarly, if you put yourself down in public, people are like, yeah, you are an idiot, aren't you? You know, that's yeah. the kind of feeling. But they're not joking. Yeah, yeah exactly. They're not, they're not joking. No, no, no. And then you're like, no, no, you're supposed to find that charming. Yes, yes. It's very not it weak. Is- it's difficult, isn't it? It comes across as weak rather than charming for people who don't notice yeah. that it's a, a self-mocking thing. Yes. Uh, Boris Johnson. Awful. Awful. How, how, how does self-deprecating humour come into the case of Boris Johnson? Or, or politics. In, or in, politics in general. Well, humour in politics is very interesting. I thought that Boris Johnson was an interesting case. Yeah, I think so too. Before all the Brexit stuff where he really lost a lot of face in terms of his public image. Well, he showed himself as the awful human being he is. Yeah, yeah, the person who basically is power hungry and ambitious and he doesn't really care what things it is that he's... Stab he's, you in the back. He's stabbing people in the back and arguing for things and lying to the public and all that stuff, mm. right? Now, before all that Brexit mm. nonsense... Boris was really quite popular with people, not with everyone, Mm. you know, obviously because he was a conservative and it's partisan. And so if you're not a conservative, you don't like him. But generally, when he was mayor of London, he did have quite a lot of popularity. He was quite funny. He was a character. Right. And people liked him. And that was one of the reasons he was tipped to be in the new PM because he had this nice image and people Mm. sort of, oh, cheeky Boris, you know. Mm. Um, And people liked him because he appeared to have a great sense of humour and that he appeared to be ready to laugh at himself. Yes. Even though underneath it all, he's just a cynical career-driven politician like Mm. the rest of them. Everyone loved the idea that he was like this cheeky, funny guy. And part of that is because he presented one or two episodes of Have I Got News For You, which is that... uh, TV show that political satire yeah and it's very funny very witty and he came on it and he was very funny on the show and like half the nation at least warmed to him to the extent that he became a sort of a celebrity yeah and a lot of that is about him showing himself as a bit of a ridiculous figure which disarms us it disarmed many people we were totally disarmed by this. I'm just bumbling Boris Johnson. You know, I'm just, oh, I've got a crazy haircut. And, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, never mind all that. I'll just go and play tennis, fall on the floor. You know. Go down a zip line. Go down a zip line. Yeah. You know, just mess up my hair if no one, if everyone, if it starts to get out of hand, just mess up the hair. And um, the other thing is that we love, I think, in Britain, we love to entertain the idea and we ent- we do entertain the idea that the Queen has got a great sense of humour. We do. That nothing would please a Brit more 
than to discover that the Queen had a wicked sense of humour. Well, the thing is, she's so mysterious. So the, the, the image that we project onto the Queen, there is often a very humorous one, although she did help to support that with the, with the Olympic Games. Exactly. When she 007 it was almost like, we knew it. Yeah. Well, I, I, HRH is hilarious. In my talk, I used that as an example of the, the best moment of our culture yeah. to date including all of the history the bringing together the the real pinnacle of british uh, civilization <laughs> was the moment where the queen jumped out of a helicopter with james bond yes and everyone i mean like i up until that point wasn't convinced by the olympics i remember mm. you know before the games was happening i was in london i was it was all everyone was complaining oh it's going to be very inconvenient it's going to you know fill up the city with tourists it's going to be a nightmare just you know rich people are going to get richer it's not going to help ordinary mm. people all this stuff and that feeling carried on until the opening ceremony of the olympic games which was brilliant you know directed yeah, by danny boyle, danny boyle amazing and that moment where uh, the Queen and James Bond mm. jumped out of the helicopter. Yes. At that point, I was like, this is amazing. It wasn't just that. No. Because because the thing is, it, because then, because the thing is, the Queen is the exact opposite of everything that might be self-deprecating or taking yourself too seriously. She's very, 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 very serious. And we see very, very little of her. But someone had to approach her and say, Your Majesty. Is this okay? And she said, love it. And she went with it and they came round and they filmed her because there was a little scene. I mean, obviously she didn't jump out the, 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 the helicopter, but there was a little scene where she meets James Bond and we presume it actually was her and not her stunt double. Mm. And it was, and even if it was her double, she still had to okay it. Yeah. And it was great because it that. was so funny and it was definitely not, it was terribly serious because she was like, okay, James, let's do this, you know, and it's a very serious moment and it was She did it with fantastic. a straight face, the whole thing. And uh, yeah, I was really proud of that moment. Yeah. And I think that just showcased Britain's sense of humour. Yeah. Like no one else in the world has done that in an, in an Olympic opening ceremony. I'm, I'm genuinely proud of that. Well, she's got all of the trappings of wealth and history and power, but her way of sort of flaunting it, she doesn't flaunt it like you'd imagine some people would, but like, look at my expensive fancy stuff and I've got all these guards. Like she doesn't need to. In fact, she does the opposite. She sort of, laughs at herself a yeah. little bit she pokes fun at herself and yeah. it was great i think everyone really liked it i mean there, there must have been some hardcore royalists who were like i can't believe that she'd be you know i even no i don't think so i even think the royalists probably just thought amazing jolly good yeah you know that she's sort of up for it she's you know she can laugh at herself yeah exactly so even the queen can laugh at herself yeah which just again shows the sort of the the how much we value that yeah definitely. Um, sarcasm and irony it's very hard to make a distinction between the two words i'm just going to keep it simple and say basically this is where you say one thing but you mean something else yeah or um you know it's often used to express frustration or to criticize someone you know essentially sort of like talking about something but you don't necessarily really mean what you say or when you mean exactly the opposite of what you say uh, and this is basically about being self-aware and, and essentially making fun of everything mm. um, sarcasm is usually used as a way of saying something negative by saying something positive I can't really explain why we use sarcasm so much I don't think we're the only ones everyone uses sarcasm I think the thing is sarcasm is like nuanced like I think teenagers use it a lot uh -huh. because they're, they're afraid and so sarcasm gets a bit of a bad rap like you're not engaging with things you're not sort of talking honestly but sarcasm also sort of debunks things it's considered to be the lowest form of humor i've heard that yeah. tell as well but that's not true it's it's excellent but maybe essentially sarcasm is used to avoid being too serious again it allows you to have distance from things keeping the distance and also keeping your emotions under control it allows you to comment on things without being it, emotional earnest again yeah there's nothing worse than being earnest it just creates this level of distance between you and the things that you're commenting on or the things you're saying uh, I think everyone does sarcasm. Here are some examples. Yeah. The weather is appalling and you go, oh, lovely weather today. Yeah. Lovely weather we're having, isn't it? Oh. Yeah. Uh, you miss the bus and you go, oh, brilliant. <laughs> yeah. Uh, someone gives you loads of work to do and you go, oh, great. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a yeah. lot. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Like your boss goes, oh, hello, Amber. So, um, you know, welcome back from your holiday. Uh, here's... Um, Here's your inbox. You can see it's full of dossiers. So there you go. <laughs> Get started. Yeah. And you go, oh, 
Thanks. Oh, great. Thanks. Brilliant. Thanks a lot. Yeah. My, my friend said uh, he was with these American girls and she was one of them was telling him about her, this job she got and it was amazing and she just loved it and it was like working with a fashion designer and she kind of couldn't believe her luck and he was sort of, she was going on about it enthusiastically and he sounds, cool, sounds awful. And she was like, no, I, I really right. like it. And he was like, no, I, I know. Yeah. <laughs> I know you like it. Yeah. Sorry, I was just... I'm, I'm agreeing with you. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. Like, um, you know, like, oh, so how was that hotel? Oh, it was disgusting. The service was awful. The beds were dirty. The shower wasn't working properly. Mm. Uh, and there was a poo in the kettle. <laughs> and you go, oh, so you, uh, so, uh, so you don't recommend it then? <laughs> You'll be going back then. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah, of course. You know, there's, there's, loads, there's loads of those sorts of things. Like... Um, <laughs> You know. Say how you really feel. Did you ever have any sarcastic teachers at school? Yep. Oh, yeah. The teachers were always sarcastic, right? Super sarcastic. So when you arrive... Especially a history teacher. Yeah. You arrive late and they go, oh, uh, Mr. <laughs> Thompson, uh, nice to see you. Uh, nice of you to join us. Nice of you to join us. You didn't perhaps see uh, Miss Minogue on your travels around the school, did you? <laughs> you know, like I, yeah. I, I imagine that uh, all of your homework's been completed. And then you, you say, oh, I haven't done it. Oh, what a surprise. Not the uh, mm. standard of uh, educational excellence that I've expected from you this year, Mr. Thompson. Yeah. Oh, come on. Yes. Yeah, oh, yeah. No, I mean, I do it. I'm a teacher. I'm pretty sarcastic with the students. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. me too. Yeah, it's easy. <laughs> Understatement. Here's another one. I need to speed things up a little yeah. bit. Understatement. This is yeah. where you minimise the importance, size, scale, or seriousness of something. Usually, it involves describing something negative as being just a little bit bad. For example, <laughs> uh, someone comes in. It's they're soaking wet. It's raining really hard, and they come in soaking wet. And you go, "Oh, raining outside, is it?" And, and the person goes, "Yeah, just a bit." Yeah, yeah. Uh, meaning, actually, it's pouring, pouring with rain. Yeah. Uh, is everything ready for the meeting? Uh, just a slight problem. We don't have any chairs and there's no electricity in the building. It's just a slight problem. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, and so innuendo is another one. Mm -hmm. Innuendo. This is like euphemism. <clears throat> it basically means saying something that also means something else, which is usually rude. Yes. And innuendo has been an extremely fertile and rich form of humour for years. In fact, there was a whole series of movies based pretty much on sexual innuendos. The carry-ons. The carry-on movies, yep. which were made in the 60s. And they basically involved people in situations where sort of vaguely suggestive or rude things would happen. And then, you know, Kenneth Williams would go, Oh, Matron. <laughs> oh, you know, yeah. all that kind of... Oh, yeah. That kind of thing. So um, we find it... Maybe it's because we still find sexual stuff a bit embarrassing in Britain. We're still not completely relaxed about well, sex. That's the whole, that's what she said. Right. Yeah. So um, I think innuendo, we find innuendo so funny because we're still a little bit uncomfortable about the subject of sex. Mm. And so <laughs> that sounded a bit rude. You know, it just kind of makes it, we're like a nation of school kids. Yeah. Essentially with that. And often you can make something an innuendo. So a statement that sounds a bit rude like, for example, so uh, you might want to get your jugs out now. And then, uh, <laughs> and you know, you can make it sound rude by going, yeah, if you know what I mean. Or it's either, if you know what I mean, or I bet you do. Yeah. Or said the actress to the bishop. Yeah. And more recently, that's what she said. Yeah. Which comes from America. Yes, yes. Now, do you know the TV show, The Great British Bake Off? I mean, I have heard of it because everyone talks about it and I've not seen it because I don't care about baking. It's basically a big cooking show about baking. Yes. And this is going to be the last thing that we do here uh, on innuendo. Okay. Uh, maybe a little bit on piss taking and a couple of other things, but we'll, we'll keep it brief. So basically the, uh, the Great mm. British Bake Off is a big cooking show about making cakes and things. Yeah. And the thing is that it's full of innuendo. Not surprising. And so whether they're intentional or not, you can find lists of innuendos from mm. the Great British Bake Off. So one Mary Berry talking about cake, she go, she apparently Mary said... Mary Berry's an older lady. She's an older lady, which makes it even funnier. Yes, hilarious. She said apparently, oh, I like a big piece. <laughs> oh, I bet you do. I like a big piece, <laughs> meaning I like a big piece of cake, but also it could suggest something else. Yes. Oh, 
<laughs> matron. Oh, matron. <laughs> um, another one. Mary Berry said, I've had many sausage rolls in my time. <laughs> and apparently Sue, the presenter, was like, I bet you have. <laughs> okay. It's funny because, of course, she's so sort of like a sweet old lady. Yeah. Yeah. Saying these dirty things. Sounding dirty. Another yeah. one is, is this. Oh, I guess I'd like it to be a bit stiffer. <laughs> Talking about talking about meringue, <laughs> yeah. making a meringue. You want the meringue yeah. to be a bit stiffer. Bit stiffer, yeah. Okay, and obviously it could refer to something yeah. else. Uh, when I squeeze it, it's, uh, it stays down. Yeah. When I squeeze it, it stays down. You've got great penetration of the drizzle. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> Which is someone, Ooh. one of the presenters advising another person on the best way to deal with lemon drizzle. Yes. And drizzle is like a sweet sauce that you serve on cake and it's supposed to be absorbed by the cake a little bit. I think it's which, really the word penetration. Which penetration. <laughs> which was the... you've, re- you've got really great penetration of the drizzle. Penetration <laughs> is when something goes into something else. Yeah. How about this one? Put your purple ring where I can see it. <sighs> I don't know. I guess dear. a purple ring was part of a cake ses- well, recipe. The thing is, all you need is one word like stiff or ring or penetration and then suddenly everything becomes a yeah. colourful innuendo. How about this one? I like the flavour of a cox. Oh. A cox is a type of apple. <laughs> it is. A, a cox is a sort of it a, It's an apple. So, but I, like I do f- like a cox. I bet you do. Yeah. Uh, can you grab my jugs? Um, which we know. Um, yeah. Oh, that's a lovely, lovely sight, isn't it? A man spreading cream. <laughs> 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 so, you know, uh, there you go. That is full, full of innuendo. But it's exactly where innuendo belongs. It's very much sort of teehee, middle Britain, you know, all cakes and doilies. More and tea, Vicar. Yes, exactly. Ooh, exactly. Yeah. I bet you do. Um, all right, so that's pretty much it. I mean, there's there's more. The the presentation ended it with fireworks and uh, uh, you know uh, standing ovation, standing ovation. People just hurling themselves to the they floor, were throwing roses and bunches of flowers onto the oh. stage for me. Yeah, uh, I did then go on to talk about comedy. Uh, you know, the difference between different types of comedy. There isn't time to do that now. There's no. also some other things that we didn't deal with, like the idea of piss taking, making, making fun of each other and stuff. But I think that's probably enough. Um, thanks for joining me, Amber. It was really my pleasure because this is a really interesting subject and you really made me think about it and you have obviously thought about it and I'm, I'm sorry we don't have time for more. But um, yeah, no, it's it's fascinating. I wish I could have seen your actual presentation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, thanks everyone for listening and uh, I will speak to you on the podcast at some point soon, right? Yes. I think... Um, We've got a plan. I've got Paul coming over soon, so I'll get you in on that. Sounds good. I think it might be Monday. Are you free? Well, it's Monday's, bank holiday. It's a bank holiday. Yeah. Okay. Should be free. Yeah. I need to. I need to make sure I'm free as well. Actually. <laughs> anyway, we'll get we'll get uh, you and Paul back on the podcast soon. All right. All right then. Okay. So there you are. I hope you now feel like you understand British humour a little bit more, or at least understand the context in which it sort of makes sense, and the way in which it relates to our communication style and other things. Leave your comments on the page for this episode on the website. I'm looking forward to reading uh, your thoughts. And, you know, you can consider questions like this. Um, Do you think that British humour is radically different to humour in your country? Does your country share any aspects of of humour with Britain? For example, you know, are people particularly sarcastic or do they use understatement or innuendo and things like that on a daily basis? Uh, Just leave your comments uh, on the page for the episode on the website. Now, there are some things that I covered in the British Council talk that I didn't cover in my conversation with Amber. So there are some things that we didn't really have time for. So let me just run through some of those things now. So I talked about stuff like innuendo, sarcasm, understatement, uh, self-deprecating humour and things like that. There are lots of other things too, like, for example, puns. So puns are simply word jokes. And um, I mean, I have talked about puns before on this podcast when I did episodes about telling jokes in English. So these are those word jokes, and there are lots of them. And sometimes people tell each other jokes Puns or word jokes work best when um, it's an instant response to something rather than just telling a pre-planned joke. So word jokes often work as witty little comments that you can make on the spur of the moment. That's when they tend to work. So 
Puns essentially work when one word means two things at the same time, connecting two previously unrelated ideas together in one statement. And your brain sort of explodes um, when you hear the punchline uh, and laughter happens because it it's because when one thing means two things at the same time. For example, I mean, and if you want more examples of puns, you can check out my episodes about telling jokes in English in the archive. But for example, you could say, how does Bob Marley like his donuts? How does Bob Marley like his donuts? With jamming. All right, now you need to know uh, the song Jammin' by Bob Marley. We're jamming, we're jamming, you know that song? But it also sounds a bit like with jam in. So how does Bob Marley like his jo- donuts? With jamming. Okay. Um, for more of that, check out Telling Jokes in English Parts 1, 2, and 3 from the episode archive. Anyway, so we have loads and loads of puns and jokes, and they happen a lot. Um, maybe this is because of our vocabulary in English, because we have a wide variety of synonyms, homonyms, and so on, which make it easy to say one thing that sounds like another thing, uh, creating endless opportunities for word jokes and also euphemisms. Um, So that's puns and word jokes and things. We also have uh, the idea of piss taking or taking the piss, taking the piss out of someone or taking the piss out of each other. And piss taking basically means making fun of each other. And we do this all the time with our friends uh, and people that we know quite well. Um, And why does this happen? Well, perhaps it's because we're just incapable of expressing genuine emotions. And so we tend to avoid sincerity because it makes us feel uncomfortable. So we interact with our loved ones and our best friends by teasing them, poking fun at them, mocking them and things like that. We're basically emotionally crippled. Like when I see my brother, uh, perhaps because we are emotionally so sort of um, incapable of you know, expressing our feelings, we tend to just make fun of each other and take the piss out of each other. And it's also when you get groups of friends together, you just kind of make fun of each other, essentially. And it has two functions. First of all, to express affection. So it's like when you say to your, your brother, you know, I say to my brother, oh, you stupid idiot, um, or something like that. And it's actually a, a way to express affection. And the other function of piss taking is to knock someone down to size if they're getting too big for their boots. So if you're in a group of friends and you're all making fun of each other, it just kind of maintains the sort of equality between everyone. And if one person is starting to get too big for their boots, you will mercilessly take the piss out of them to make them realize that they're not special, they're not above everyone else. Okay, and you know, you need to be able to take a joke in the UK. You've got to be able to take a joke and dish it out when necessary. And if you can do those things, then you're basically all right. Uh, There's also surreal humour. Essentially, surreal humour involves making fun of absolutely everything around you. And it makes fun of existence itself. And it means making absurd statements to highlight the absurdity in life. And it's about, I think, subverting boring reality And maybe this is something to do with our weather, you know, the fact that it's dull or it's a form of indirect anarchy or something like that. Um, But, you know, surreal humour is basically about making weird or absurd statements. You you see it a lot in comedy shows like um, Monty Python's Flying Circus. Um, Now, it's worth noting a couple of things here about inappropriate humour or things that are inappropriate in humour. Now, although in the UK, we use humour all the time. And as I said before, that there's there's always a time and a place for humour. It is worth noting that it can get you into trouble if you do it badly. So it, although we love, you know, humour and it's very important and it's uh, pervasive, it doesn't mean that absolutely every subject is um, a kind of a good topic for, for a joke be careful of who or what is the target of your humour. It's very politically incorrect to make jokes about certain groups in society, particularly groups that are lower status than you. So, you know, these kinds of jokes are generally outlawed. And I'm talking about things like ethnic jokes or sexist jokes. Generally, it's very unfashionable and in very bad taste to make jokes about uh, different ethnic groups or different groups in society in general. It's bad taste, it's old-fashioned, and it's not really cool. So watch out for that. Um, Then I went on to talk about, in the British Council talk, I went on to talk about comedy, uh, British comedy shows, the difference uh, between British and American comedy shows, 
and then some recommended shows. But I think this is another episode for the future because uh, if I start talking about comedy now, that's like the whole second part of my talk and there isn't time for it in this episode. So maybe I'll do an episode in the future about British comedy in general, although I've been doing uh, little episodes focusing on different you know, specific shows or specific comedians uh, from the UK um, on this podcast over the years. And I do continue, I do intend to continue doing that. Anyway, thank you very much for listening to this episode. As I said before, I hope you now feel like you've got more, a bit more of an understanding of sort of what goes into British humour and, and what it's all about. And uh, I hope that I might have demystified it slightly or something. Anyway, as I said, leave your comments in the comments section. Thanks for listening. I look forward to reading your comments. I'll speak to you again on the podcast soon. Don't forget to join the mailing list on the website. Just enter your email address. And um, when you've confirmed the email in your inbox, then every time I upload new content, you'll get a convenient little email dropping into your inbox with a link. And that link will take you straight to the relevant page for the episode where you can find notes and bits of transcription and videos and other little bits of content, as well as the download link for the episode and so on. Um, uh, by the way, my my website still doesn't look very good on a mobile phone. So if you click that link on your iPhone or your Android phone and you open up the website, it probably looks terrible. There's a huge li- list of menu items and I, I just can't do anything about it. I'm sure I'm now going to get comments, messages from people offering their help and I might take you up on it. But anyway, you know, just bear in mind that the website doesn't look great on a mobile I think that's also it. Remember, I've moved my website host recently, uh, my audio host. I've moved it recently. I'm no longer uploading episodes onto audioboom.com these days. Instead, they're going up to Libsyn, which is teacherluke.libsyn.com, L-I-B-S-Y-N. That's where you'll find stuff like just the episodes and the RSS feed and things like that. If you are still using Audio Boom, well, I imagine if you if you're listening to this, you're not using Audio Boom anymore. But um, anyway, Audio Boom is is it's kind of inactive now, um, so I'm not using that. By the way, I'm also I've also started uploading my audio episodes onto YouTube. What do you think of that? Is it worth it? Just shall I be doing that? Just the audio, not not as videos, just the audio stuff, because Libsyn allows me to upload onto YouTube simultaneously uh, while also uploading onto my RSS feed. So anyway, that's happening. Um, let me know your thoughts about all of this stuff, and I'll speak to you on the podcast soon. But for now, it's time to say goodbye. Bye, 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 bye. Thanks for listening to Luke's English Podcast. For more information, visit teacherluke.co.uk.